Once again, welcome. We're so glad that all of you are here with us again this morning, and uh, we're going to continue. Last week, we started a new series, Unshakable. We're studying in the book of Daniel, Unshakable, when conviction and culture collide. And so we're in the, the Old Testament book of Daniel, and we're kind of diving in. And I, you know, this book of Daniel has it all. Uh, if you read through the book of Daniel, you'll see that it has history, prophecy, politics, and prayer. In fact, the book of Daniel is filled with all kinds of adventure. There's lions and there's statues and there's wild animals and there's a, a fiery furnace. There are dreams and there are visions and there's a king who even thought himself to be a cow. I'll just let that, yeah, that it, it, it. Really, I mean, the book of Daniel is filled with all kinds of things. There's amazing escapes, incredible adventure, angels, demons, uh, details about ancient history, and amazing prophecies about the end times. And so I can think of no better book to dive into uh, that, that really helps us in our own culture, in our own situation, than the book of Daniel. And it begins in Babylon, with Babylon besieging the city of Jerusalem. And we talked a little bit about this last week. Literally, Babylon came in, and Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon at that time, and he was taking territory all over the place. He besieged the city of Jerusalem. He broke down its walls. He destroyed the temple. He carried back all of the, the articles of the temple back to uh, the place, the treasuries and household of his gods. And as it, it was as if he's saying, God is dead, I'm God. And yet at the same time, the beginning of that very chapter in Daniel chapter 1 says that it was the Lord in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 2 who gave Jehoiachin, king of Judah, into his hands. Which means that Nebuchadnezzar was really not in control, even though he thought he was in control, but God was in control. Why? Why was God in control? Why would God allow 25% of the population of people to be carried back to Babylon for exile for 70 years? Well, because the people of Judah had fallen into idolatry. They had begun to worship other gods. They had slipped away from their worship of Jehovah and they began to incorporate the gods of the nations around them. They had drifted into idolatry and they had began to worship Baal and they had began to set up the poles to Asherah and other, other gods. There was great immorality as a result of their idolatry. It turned their hearts and there was great immorality and there was also great injustice against the weakest people in their land. And the prophets had warned them. The prophets had called them to repentance over and over and over again, telling them that God's judgment was coming, that God's judgment and wrath was coming if they did not repent. And they did not. They continued to persist in disobedience. And as a result, again, Daniel 1, 2, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. He carried off the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God. And part of that 25% of people that were carried away were some young men. Some young men who are around 15, 16 years old, just teenagers at the time, the best and the brightest of those in Israel, the best and the brightest of those in Judah, and the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar, he had plans for them. In fact, for those taken captive in Babylon, Babylon was not their home. They were aliens. They were exiles in a land that was not their home. They were a minority of Hebrew people that did not belong in the land in which they were taken to. Friends, did you know the Bible describes us as followers of Jesus Christ? Those that are disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus Christ as aliens and exiles in this world. First Peter, Peter wrote this in First Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Peter describes those who are believers in his day, followers of Jesus in his day, his description of them is that they are exiles, that they are aliens in a world that is not their home. In fact, in the Old Testament, Abraham was called to leave the land of Ur of the Chaldees, his homeland, for a land that he did not know. And more than just a physical land, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10 
describes something more that was going on way back in the Old Testament with Abraham. And it says this, by faith, he, meaning Abraham, made a home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking for, forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. Friends, what we see is that even Abraham, who had been called out and called to a different land, a land that we call now the promised land, a land that would be his home, lived as, a, as an exile, lived as a foreigner among that land, lived in tents, not because he was looking for a physical land, but rather he recognized that there was a greater promise, there was a greater city, there was an eternal home whose architect and builder was God. And, 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 and later on we see this. Notice he lived as a stranger, temporary tense, awaiting something better. Hebrews eleven thirteen. All these people were still living by faith. This is, this is talking about those in the, the faith chapters when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them, welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on this earth. And, and I share that because I think that sometimes as believers in Jesus Christ, we forget that there, this is not our home. We forget that this world is not our home. We forget that this country is not our, our true home. It is a temporary place. It is a temporary destination. It is a place when we have a place where we have been planted for a season and for a purpose to live as exiles and strangers and aliens in this land. But friends, there is a better promise that is to come. There is a better promise that is to come. There is a better, more eternal home that is to come. But the problem is when we don't live as Abraham in tents where it's a temporary dwelling, when we don't see this as a temporary place, then we begin to hang on to things in this world as if they're all that we have. And so when we lose them, we lose our joy. When it's taken away, we lose our joy. When our freedom is taken, we lose our joy. When our rights are taken, we lose our joy, forgetting that this is just temporary. So how do we live as strangers and exiles in a world that is not our home? You see, that's where we find Daniel. That's where we find, that's where we find Daniel. That's where we find these, these exiles, these 15 and 16-year-old kids were carried off to a land that was not their home. They were exiles and strangers in this land. Like you and I, we are exiles and strangers on this earth. But friends, there is a different plan. But how do we hold to biblical values? How do we hold to biblical convictions and a culture that does does not accept that, that oftentimes collides with the very culture in which we live. That is, a, that is a difficult thing. And yet Daniel successfully navigated this as he began to live for the Lord in a culture that was not his own. And today we're going to look at three phases that Daniel experienced right here in Daniel chapter 1. As Daniel begins to take some initial steps that demonstrate to us how do we live in a culture that is not our own, that tries to force us and pressure us to conform to its ways? So the first thing that we, we see, the first phase is Daniel, is the pressure that he faced. The pressure that Daniel faced, and we're going to see three of his friends. We know them best by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was not their original names as we're going to see. But there was great pressure upon them, great pressure upon Daniel, great pressure upon these young men to conform to their new culture, to conform to their new home. How many know there's great pressure today to conform to the values and the patterns of this world? And Daniel faced those pressures. In fact, we read in verse 3, then the king ordered Aspenaz, we'll just call him Ash, Aspenaz, chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. We're talking about the best and the brightest, friends. 
We're talking about the best and the brightest. We're talking about the brains. We're talking about the brawn. We're, 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 we, I mean, the, these guys had it all, right? And, and he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned to them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter into the king's service. And among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Friends, we just want to call this Operation Assimilation. Because that's what's going on. This is, this is Operation Assimilation that is happening. It is very intentional, and it's a very strategic process that began with a change of location. So they went in, and they took 25% of the people out of Judah, and they brought them back to Babylon. And so you have these young, impressionable teenagers at a very critical time in their lives because they are facing a great transition. They are removed from the location and the home in which they've known. They're removed from their parents. They're removed from uncles and aunts. They're removed from their community and they're immediately placed into the palace or this area of, of, of Babylon where they are educated for three years. So the change of location from a land that was unfamiliar to them. And again, what we see is for three years, they're immersed in, not, in, in all kinds of Babylonian knowledge and culture, in history, in language, and in religion. And the goal was to wipe out their memory from everything in Israel, all ties that they had to Israel's culture and religion. Basically, forget about the law of Moses. Forget about the things that you've heard. You don't need Jehovah God any longer. By the way, I defeated him and I carried all of those things out of the temple and put them in the treasury of my God. So guess Guess what? Your God is dead. Your God is weak. And my God is strong. I am God. My gods are strong. So forget about all of that because I'm about to teach you where our strength comes from. I'm going to teach you all the knowledge, all the things that you need. You're going to learn all the history. You're going to learn all the culture. You're going to learn all the things that we know here in Babylon because we're the best. We're the best. We're going to secularize you. And that's what's happening. And on top of that, if you do well in all of this, we're going to promote you to higher positions. So if you do well, I mean, you're the best and the brightest, and we're going to train you. And you do well, we're going to promote you. Who doesn't like a promotion, right? Especially a 15, 16-year-old kid that's all of a sudden been relocated and now is given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to be able to advance in this new kingdom. Why not, right? They teach them language. They teach them culture. They teach them new habits. They give them new names, new religion, and they give them a new diet. An incredible strategy. I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar uh, knew the history of, of Israel, knew the history of Egypt when, when uh, way back when, when, when Israel had been slaves 400 years in, 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 under Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a different approach. And this is why I bring this up. I just really found this as I was digging in. I just really found this to be very interesting that Pharaoh's approach was quite different. If you look at Pharaoh's approach, when the Israelites had been in, 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 in Egypt, they had gone there willingly under Joseph, but then a new Pharaoh rose up who did not know Joseph. And, and all of a sudden he's seeing that these people are multiplying. This family is now becoming a nation. And, and so he's afraid. So what does he do? He decides that his way is going to be to oppress them. And, and he oppressed the people as slaves and he put heavy handed burdens upon them. This is what Pharaoh did. And in Exodus 1, 11 and 12, it says, so they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithov and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. And the more they oppressed, look what happens, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. And, and, and then he told the midwives, hey, I want you to kill all the baby boys as soon as they're born. You can't let these baby boys continue to live. But the Hebrew midwives didn't. They didn't follow the order. Instead, they chose to honor, chose to honor and follow God. And Exodus 1.20 says that God was kind to the midwives because the people increased and became even more numerous. You say, Pastor, why are you sharing this? 
Because Nebuchadnezzar's approach is very different than Pharaoh's approach. Pharaoh's approach is oppression. Pharaoh's approach is slavery. Pharaoh's approach is, is to be heavy-handed. And the more heavy-handed he was, and the more he, the more he pressed, and the more he pushed, and the more he said, no, 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 the more they increased in number. But Nebuchadnezzar's approach is different. Nebuchadnezzar is sly. He says, well, that didn't work for Pharaoh. I don't know if he said it or not, but maybe he thought, you know what? That didn't work for Pharaoh. I think a better way for us to do this is let's bring them in and let's begin to give them the best of the best. Let's show them what we have here in Babylon and let them experience the best education and let them experience all that we have. Let's wine them and let's dine them and let's give them the best of the king's food and tell them to forget about their diet. That was like, how could your God have you have that kind of a diet. I mean, just eat the best of the best. And it was to kind of seduce them a little bit. Can you imagine this slick, intentional plan? 15, 16 year old, impressionable teenagers that have been all of a sudden life transitioned to a new way. But instead of experiencing this heavy handedness, instead they're offered everything. They're offered the best of everything. I mean, after all, who can resist? Who can resist that kind of enticement? Who can resist that kind of a thing? In other words, here's what the king said. Just, just taste and see the Babylonian life. Look at the Babylonian life and you'll never want to go back to that other life again. That other life is so restrictive for you. Your God is so restrictive to you. Come follow me. Come follow me and, and see the Babylonian life. And then you'll see that you can believe like the Babylonians and you can behave like the Babylonians and, 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 and you, you, you can begin to see that I got a different plan. I don't know about you, but that kind of that mirrors what our spiritual enemy does, doesn't it? He loves to entice us in the ways of his ways, right? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't come right out. Oh, no. He says, oh, look at that. Isn't this way better? Isn't this way better? This way is so much better. This way is so much in, enticing. Uh, come on. The prince of darkness wants to say followers of Christ. Come on. Think like I think. Believe like I believe. Behave like I behave. In fact, Satan wants everybody on planet earth, friends, to disregard the teaching of the one true God and to submit and surrender to the systems of this world. And it's subtle. It's subtle, isn't it? It's not this all outright, this is horrible, this is terrible. Instead, it's this enticing, come on, let me lure you, let me deceive you. Lower your standards a little bit and experience what I have to offer. I think it's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 11 and verse 13 as well. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand Take your stand against the devil's schemes in verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, stand. Stand. Why? Because Paul recognized the scheme of the enemy was to try to get us to conform to the pattern of this world. To the systems of this world. And Paul says in order to resist. You've got to put on the full armor of God. You've got to take your stand. You see we have to learn the subtle ways. In which our culture. In which the enemy presses and entices us. And tries to squeeze us into its mold. Often there's great persecution and fear to conform. But many times what I find. It's simply the enticing pressure to conform the enticing pressure to conform to the patterns of this world and that's the pressure that daniel was facing that's the pressure that the other three hebrews who were with him and all of those who had come not just those who were named but there were many others who were pressured to conform and friends that's the way of the enemy the enemy in our culture is always trying to pressure us to conform to its mold so what was the strategy second phase is the strategy that he employed the strategy that Daniel employed. Have you ever heard the expression, I feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place? 
Ever been there in between a rock and a harp? So here, here is Daniel, 15, 16 years old, been plucked out of everything that he's known, and all of a sudden he's facing this immense pressure because you've got this great king, Nebuchadnezzar, who's putting on the pressure through his servants and saying, this is, this is going to be your education. This is going to be your diet. These are going to be your names. This is going to be, this is the way it is. And so you, you've got him between a rock and a hard place here. And so here is Daniel caught in the middle between, do I serve God or do I serve Nebuchadnezzar? What what are the ways that I serve God and what are the ways that I can begin to relax because of the pressure that Nebuchadnezzar is putting on? And, and, and so we see that, that, that Daniel doesn't want to defile himself against God, but at the same time, he, he recognizes that sometimes you, you've got to choose your stand. Sometimes you've got to choose your stand. And, and so if Daniel simply refused what Nebuchadnezzar expected, then he'd be in trouble with the king who had taken him captive. But if he, if he conformed to everything, then he wouldn't be pleasing to God. He's between a rock and a hard place. What is he to do? In Daniel 1.8, we see an important key to the strategy. We touched on it last week, but it's so important. I want to hit on it again. And it's verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And the key word here is resolved. Daniel resolved. Or another translation says that he purposed in his heart. Daniel resolved ahead of time, purposed in his heart ahead of time, a predetermined resolution as to what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And, and as I share, there was great pressure to conform when it came to education and, and learning part of the history and the customs and the culture and the language and the religion and the politics of Babylon. Daniel did not take a stand in that way. Why? Right? Why? Why wouldn't Daniel take a stand if it's you and I? I mean, we're saying, come on, I'm not getting this secular education. You're not going to get put all that stuff into me. But that's not the place where Daniel takes a stand. Well, friends, there was a little bit of precedence for this. In fact, going back to the time when, when, uh, when Israel was in, in Egypt, a guy by the name of Moses, whose mother did not want to kill him, the midwife did not want to kill Moses, and said, put him in a basket and floated him down the river. And Pharaoh's daughter found him and drew him out, which is where he got his name, drawn out of the water. Moses from uh, began to raise him as her own son. And Acts chapter 7 and verse 22 gives us this insight into what was happening at that time. And it says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And was powerful in speech and action, which I just find to be amazing because Moses himself says to God later, I can't talk. <laughs> A sideline here. Sometimes the, there are things that, that God sees in us that we forget about ourselves. There was purpose to the education. There was purpose. God had a purpose and a plan for Moses' life right from the very beginning. And the education that Moses received was going to help later on when he would stand before Pharaoh later on. Understanding the culture and the customs and the gods. Understanding when the plagues would come exactly what the reason was that God was, was doing what he was doing. You see, Moses learned the ways of the Egyptians, but it did not turn him from the God of Israel. And when it came to education, Daniel thought, you know what? I can learn the ways of Babylon, but it's not going to turn me away from God. In fact, I can learn and I can begin to say, okay, let me understand your custom. Let me understand your language. Let me understand your history so that when it comes time for me to be used in government, I can take that knowledge and I can turn it around and I can use it for God's glory. That's what missionaries do all the time. Missionaries go overseas all the time to a culture they do not know. They learn a language that is not their language to learn. And they begin to understand in the ways of the culture for a purpose of reaching the people in that culture. And so the why behind what they did was going to be very important. So Daniel says, you know, I won't, I won't take a stand there. How about name changes, right? Right. Certainly their Hebrew names were part of the desire for their parents to remind them that they serve the God of Israel. I mean, after all, Daniel's name means God is my judge. Jehovah, Yahweh is my judge. God is my judge. And this new name that he was given, Belshazzar, Bel, a Babylonian god, Tazar, to protect the king, literally means to the keeper of hidden mysteries. 
Why would Daniel want to take on a a name of a Babylonian God when he was given a name by his parents to signify his God, Jehovah, my God as judge? And how about the others? I mean, the same thing. Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious. He became Shadrach, meaning command of a coup. Kamu was a, a Sumerian sun god. Michelle's name meant who is like the Lord. And instead, his name was changed to who is what a coup is. Like you're going to be a, like just like the Babylonian god, a coup. Azaria, the Lord is my helper, became Abednego, servant of Nebo, another Babylonian god. Why didn't they take their stand and the names that they were called? Well, quite frankly, friends, we can't determine who calls us what. People will call you all kinds of things. And you can't control it. People call you whatever they want to call you. When I was growing up in in youth group, I got the nickname A.T. because of Aaron Taylor. It didn't matter. I could say, don't call me A.T., call me Aaron. You know what? If people want to call me A.T., they call me A.T. I know that's not, you know, uh, a similar kind of thing. But but the bottom line is, is you know what? (laughs) We get called all kinds of things. I mean, Joseph, when he was in... Egypt, when he had been taken, he was given a new Egyptian name too. Pharaoh gave him the name Zaphonath Paneah. That's why his brothers didn't recognize him. They didn't even recognize his name because he was given an Egyptian name and yet he still prospered. It doesn't matter what people call you as long as you remember who God calls you. As long as you remember your identity in God, who you are in God. And that's the reality. Daniel knew that what someone called him would not change who he was when it came to God. He still knew who he was. So what about the food? Why food? You ever ask that question? I mean, probably when we take a look at the things that, that Daniel took a stand, uh, took, didn't take a stand against and the thing he did take a stand against, we'd probably have the reverse order. We'd probably say, well, what's the big deal about food? I'm not, I'm not going to take that secular education. You're not going to put all that in my head. We'd probably say, don't call me that. I'm not going to take that name from you. When it came to food, all right, I'll eat a little bit. That sounds really good. I mean, after all, 15, 16-year-old boys, I mean, they eat a lot, right? They eat a lot. What is it about food? Why did Daniel prioritize something different? I think because it says Daniel resolved not to defile himself against the Lord. And these other things were external things, but the defiling was a choice as to what he would put into his own physical body. The defiling had to do what he would put, what he would put into his mouth, what he would consume. And Daniel resolves not to defile himself, meaning to corrupt or pollute or contaminate, meaning loss of purity. And perhaps there's a few reasons, one of them being that it probably, the Babylonian food did not follow the kosher laws in the law of Moses that he gave in the book of Leviticus. God had given certain kosher laws to the people of Israel. And there's a good chance because of the word defiling that the way in which they ate meant something very much to them in in the fact that they did not want to defile themselves because it would have been a direct violation of God's law. Secondly, food oftentimes by the Babylonians that the king ate was food that was sacrificed to their idols or sacrificed to their gods. And so by consuming that, it would have been an act of worship unto the Babylonian gods. And so Daniel's stand was really a stand of worship saying, I'm not going to consume something that was used in worship to another god. See, he wanted to honor God and the worship of Yahweh alone. But I think there's something more going on than just the dietary food, the food sacrifice to idols that's happening with Daniel's decision to stand. If you think about it for a moment, go back to Nebuchadnezzar's plan. Nebuchadnezzar's plan was was not oppression, but rather it was enticing. It was enticing them in the cultures and the ways of Babylon. And part of the richness of the food was you're going to eat what your fellow captives are not going to eat. 
I, I'm going to wine you, and I'm going to dine you, and, and, and I've, got, I, I've got some things that, 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 that I want you to consume, and I'm the most powerful man in the country, and I've got some perks to offer you, and there was this enticing that was going on. You're going to live in luxury. You're going to get preferential treatment, the best education, the most expensive and gourmet food, and if you're a 15-year-old that's been taken away from home, who could turn that down? But part of it, part of it was to whine and and dine and, and, and to give them a taste of Babylon. And I think the idea here is the enticing and the taste. Daniel and his friends would have been given the seduction of the enemy to take a taste of Babylon. Just get a taste of Babylon. And if you compromise here, you'll compromise everywhere else. Think about Think about food for a moment. Think about enticement and food. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, you have Eve that is hanging out by a tree that God said, don't eat of this tree. And here comes the serpent. When she saw that it was pleasing to the eye and good for food, did God really not say, just take a taste, just one bite she gave to her husband just one, just one bite, just one bite, just one taste, right? Just one taste. How about Esau? Esau lost his very birthright over a taste of stew. He was willing to lose it over a taste. And friends, I'm going to tell you that when you get a taste of this culture, so many times that taste is the very thing that takes you away from God. It's just that taste that says, oh, the seduction of the enemy. Let me just get a taste of this world. Let me get a taste of the way the culture of this world. Oh, I grew up in the church and all these rules and all this oppression and all of these things. And no, no, no. Oh, but my friends look like they're having so much fun. Oh, this world is just having so much fun. Why can't I just get a taste? Because it's a taste that's going to lead you away from God. It's just a taste. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not get a taste. He would not take the taste. He would not take the, the bite to, to get the taste of the world for something that would lure him into further compromise. Yeah, it seems like a little thing, but it was a big thing because that very taste could take him off course. And so he resolved in his heart that this was the place he was going to take his stand. This was the place that he would make his decision. This was the place that he would say, you know what? I'm not giving in. And I would argue for all of us as followers of Jesus Christ, for those of you that are followers of Christ, that you've got to resolve in your heart what you're going to take a stand against. You've got to resolve in your heart, purpose in your heart ahead of time, for the stand you're going to take. Sometimes we say, oh, I'd never do that. I'd never go that. I'd never do that. I wouldn't do that. And then we get to that place, but we haven't resolved in our heart to decide what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. And it's so easy in the moment when you're enticed to be dragged away. It's so easy in the moment. Friends, when I was a young man, I made a predetermined decision. A predetermined decision as a young man when I was a teenager, that I would wait and I would not have sex before marriage. That I would wait and I would save that and I would honor God and the principles in his word and I would honor my future wife. My wife did the same thing. When we met, we dated for three years, we were engaged for a year and a half. And I can tell you that there are temptations that are there, there are temptations that are real, but we purposed in our heart ahead of time. That we would not defile ourselves in that way. That we would honor God and we would not follow the ways of the culture. And we would not move in together and live together outside of the bonds of marriage. And we would not have sex prior to marriage. We resolved in our heart to do that ahead of time. Friends, there are things you have to purpose in your heart not to do. Young people, you got a purpose in your heart. I will not, if I'm around a party with my friends, I, I'm not going to drink of the alcohol. I'm not going to take the drugs. I'm not going to take a taste of that lifestyle. I, I'm not, I'm not going to look at the pornography. You got to resolve in your heart ahead of time. Some of you adults, you got to resolve in your heart ahead of time what you're going to do at your job. 
What you're going to do when the pressure to conform comes, when the pressure to stand around the water cooler and have a gossip session comes. No, I purpose in my heart, I will not defy the Lord in that way. I will not gossip. I purpose in my heart that when my marriage is rocky, I purpose in my heart that I'm not going to find somebody of the opposite sex and begin to complain to my wife about them and seek counsel, their loving counsel. Because you know what? Then my emotions start to get tied to that person. And what becomes, in terms of a phileo friendship love, all of a sudden turns to an eros love. And I have sinned against my wife. And I've sinned against the relationship. I've sinned against my spouse. And I moved into adultery. How did that happen? Because I did in purpose in my heart what I was going to do and what I was not going to do. You've got to decide now because the culture of this world says do whatever you want to do until you cross the line and somebody says me too and then you've lost it all until you've lost your marriage, until you've lost your family, until you've lost the respect of your kids. Until you've lost your job, then nobody has grace for you and nobody cares because you crossed the line. But up until then, go ahead. Go ahead. It'll be okay. You've got to resolve in your heart what to do. Daniel took his stand, but how he did it was equally important. And I've got to finish up. Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Then God caused... The official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of what my Lord, the king who assigned me your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? And the the king would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard who was the chief official appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat, water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men uh, who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Notice what Daniel did not do. Daniel didn't get a sign with his friends. And write on it, we will not eat, we will not eat, we will not eat. <laughs> he didn't stay just sit in at the dinner table. You know, he, he, didn't make, he didn't go on social media and start blasting old Nebuchadnezzar, right? Partly because off with his head, you know, uh, in that way. <laughs> right? You got to decide the strategy. All right. So let me just, I'm going to quickly move through this. First is prayer. And you say prayer, prayer is not even mentioned in this verse. Prayer is not even here. But, but Daniel 1, 9 says that God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Who, 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 who gave him the, who, who, who was the one who gave favor, who caused the official to show favor? God did. And you know, throughout Daniel's life, if you, when you, when we continue to read, when we get to chapter two and, and, and we go through, you're going to find that Daniel was a praying man. Daniel, that just doesn't happen overnight, all right? Daniel was praying. He and his friends were praying about what to do. Friends, before you, when you take your stand, you got to pray about it. You need God to show you favor. You need God to go before you. You've got to pray about it, all right? You've got to pray about it. Nehemiah is a great example of that. He prayed and he fasted before he went to the king with the burden that he had. You've got to pray and you've got to fast. Second, be courteous and respectful. Be courteous and respectful. So many times, our attitude ruins everything. It's not about the stand. The stand might be right, but how we go about the stand sometimes is wrong. You see, Daniel and his friends went, and they talked to the right people. There were people that had been placed over them. There was Ashpenaz who had been placed over them. There was another official. If you read, there's two. There was somebody else who was a a servant of Ashpenaz who was was put over them. And they went to those people, and they they talked to them in a courteous way. And they said, listen, we we really can't eat this. (laughs) This, this kind of violates, uh, you know, our God. We want something else to eat. And we really can't eat this. And, and so they went with them in a very courteous way. Friends, I, I just want you to know that sometimes the way in which we do things is equally important as the stand that we take. Esther used wisdom. She didn't just barge right into the throne room when she had a problem because Haman was, was going to destroy all of her people. She didn't just barge right in and say, how could you let this happen? What is wrong with you, you terrible king? Aren't you smart enough to see what Haman has done? He's destroying all of my people. She didn't do that. She asked for people to pray and fast. 
she invited the king to a meal, to a banquet. She invited her enemy to a banquet. And she whined and she dined. And then they said, what's your request? And she said, well, come back tomorrow. And she fed them again. Why? Because how we take a stand is equally as important as the stand that we take. And as followers of Jesus Christ, our attitude and our actions ought to mirror those of Jesus. They ought to mirror those of Jesus. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't and people don't hear us. Thirdly, be creative in the solution you propose. Be creative. There was a, there was a solution. They, they considered, here's part of the courtesy. When you read this, they considered the fear. They recognized that the ones they were going to were under authority. They were under authority of Nebuchadnezzar. They recognized the fear. They honored the fear. They, they took time to honor that. And they came up with a creative solution. And they said, you know what? Just test us for, for 10 days. Just test us, all right? If we're not looking any good, then we'll just, we'll just, we'll, we'll change. But we trust that our God and our source of strength is because of our God. And so, you know what? Test us in this and see. Sometimes you got to have a creativity in the stand that you take. Come up with a creative solution in the stand that you take. I have a personal story, but I don't have time to share it today, uh, about a stand that we took, about a book that was being done in eighth grade English in our local school system. And we prayed about it, and we went, and we talked to the right people about it. And when we talked to the right people about it, we realized that, that, that what we wanted in terms of the book completely thrown out wasn't going to be something that was going to happen. So we decided instead of an all or nothing approach to come up with a compromise, which was, well, at least have a permission slip sent home, an alternative book for others to read who do not line up with this. Sometimes, friends, when you take a stand, you've got to go in with the right attitude and you've got to be willing to get creative. You've got to be willing to get creative. Eventually, we got what we wanted. But we did it in a courteous way and we did it in the right, we, we did it in a way that proposed a creative solution in which everybody could feel as if they won. Thirdly, the outcome he enjoyed. The outcome he enjoyed. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So <laughs> isn't that great? These four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kings. So they, they took a stand. But friends, understand, the stand they took was not just a one-time meal. For three years, they were only going to eat vegetables and water. For three years. Some of us want to take a stand, but we don't want the pain that's associated with taking the stand. They were consistent with the stand. And as a result of that, the reward was that God honored them, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Friends, God's ways are the best ways. When you compromise and conform to the patterns of this world, you will find less peace, you will have more stress, and you'll have more painful consequences. That's just the bottom line. But Daniel and his friends found that standing for the Lord, they were healthier physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and the best was still to come. Remember, there were promotions that were involved in this. And they now had the biggest test that they'd ever faced, the oral exam before Nebuchadnezzar himself. He didn't just, it wasn't just an aptitude, write it down. He wanted them to stand, each one before him, and he was going to orally grill them and test them. This is what it says in verse 18. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked to them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. And he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Why? Because they chose to honor God. And when they chose to honor God, God chose to honor them. When they chose to honor God, God chose to honor them. Sometimes we are so afraid to take a stand because we're afraid of the consequences. But friends, when you stand with God, you'll find that he stands with you. When you honor God, he stands with you. And friends, there is no greater reward. So we're going to close. Our, friend, our, our world wants to squeeze you into its mold. I'm just going to let you know that right now. 
We haven't felt the pressure that some of the other uh, nations around us have, have felt. They felt more of a Pharaoh oppression. We haven't experienced that kind of oppression and that kind of persecution. Instead, the tactic in our world today is much more subtle. It's a Nebuchadnezzar type of way where the enemy wants to whine and dine. The enemy wants to, wants to, to, to pull us and entice us. The enemy wants us to get a, a taste of the Babylon of this world so that we will compromise in other areas of our faith. But friends, you've got to purpose in your heart. You've got to resolve in your heart the stand. What is the stand that you need to take? What's the stand against sin? What's the stand against the pattern of this world that God is calling you to take a stand in? God is calling you to take a stand. God says this is in this area, you need to take a stand because this is what my word says. I think sometimes we stand for the wrong things. We compromise in the areas we should take a stand, and we take a stand in areas we should just let go. In areas that, to be honest with you, don't, don't matter. When it comes to following Jesus, they don't matter. As exiles and strangers in this world, what is God calling you to take a stand in? Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here and you'd say, you know, Pastor, I'm just feeling the onslaught. I'm feeling that pressure. Daniel and his friends praise pressure, pressure to conform. And man, I feel it. I feel that pressure in this world to conform to the patterns of this world. I, I feel that pressure to conform and change the way that I think and change, maybe adjust what God's word says. I feel that pressure to take that bite. I feel that pressure, that enticement. And you know, I, I want to take a stand. And I just, I need, I need the Holy Spirit to help me take that stand. I need that Holy Spirit to help me take that stand. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. If that's you, will you slip up your hand today? I want to pray for you. I'm feeling pressured in this world. And I need the Spirit of God to help me take my stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we thank you, those in person, those watching online today, that, Lord, you are greater than any pressure that we face to conform to the patterns of this world. Father, we know that in this world there is a, a subtle shift away from your word and a, away from what your word says. And when we take a stand, we stand out. And there is great pressure to conform. But I pray, Lord, that you will help each of us today to purpose in our heart to resolve in our heart what it is that we will not compromise what is it in your word that we will not compromise what is it in your word that we say you know what enough i will not compromise i will not defile myself in that way against the lord i will not sin against the lord in that way father we want to be your people that stand up and stand out for your kingdom, for your glory, for you stood up for us at the cross. We thank you today, and we ask you to fill us full of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.